Money laundering is most often associated with financial institutions, but real estate agents can also be the targets of money laundering schemes. The banks and now non-bank mortgage companies have programs in place to detect money laundering and they're, they're, they're quite effective, um, but it doesn't completely mitigate the risk and that's why we're sort of talking about the risk factors here. Um, what we'd like to do is sort of raise awareness of, of the risk factors that I'm going to discuss. I think when you look at the risk, you're looking at three sort of different categories of risk. And, and the real estate agent or broker is trying, to, is trying to assess how risky, how much of a problem this particular transaction is. The first risk deals with geography. And that, that is sort of where is, where is the person located? Where is the source of funds? Are they from a, a, a jurisdiction that, that, we would, that we would assess as being of higher risk? And one of the things you could perhaps look at is the Office of Foreign Asset Control's um, list of sanctioned countries, which is on the Department of Treasury's website. Um, the second uh, sort of category is, is what I would call transaction risk. And that's, uh, as it sounds, what, what about the transaction may raise some suspicion. And that would involve disproportionate use of cash or perhaps having a third party uh, pay for the property when it's not uh, a spouse. The third is sort of, a, again, a, a customer risk. And that, again, that, that would involve c certain customers from, from uh, high-risk countries or, or, or uh, politically exposed persons. So the idea is to sort of look at, you know, get a holistic picture of, of what the risk is like. What should uh, a real estate professional do when uh, some of the suspicions have been aroused? If you think there is a risk, I think what, what the NAR um, calls for and what actually the international community calls for is for you to do some sort of due diligence. And that really involves sort of identifying who you're dealing with. If it's uh, what we call a natural person, then sort of a getting their sort of ID if you can. Thank you. For some additional insights, uh, we'd like to turn now to Leslie Walker in NAR's legal division who worked uh, with Michael and myself uh, and uh, her colleagues uh, in legal in developing the uh, guidelines. Every agent should have a reasonable belief that they understand and know the true identity of their client. However, in instances where a real estate professional is not sure that they understand and know the true identity of their client, perhaps they're working in a non-face-to-face -face manner with their client, an agent needs to take additional measures to identify their client, whether that's through collecting additional information from their client or through third-party sources to confirm certain information or collect additional information. Leslie, thank you. The next sort of gradation is there is something called a suspicious activity report. It is um, a report that banks and other institutions make. It's, it's filed uh, at the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. And it, 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 it basically allows a person to sort of note a particular transaction and fill out a narrative. Uh, and it's a very important tool for law enforcement to sort of begin an, an investigation. And again, that, we call it suspicious activity report, can be found at the U.S. Department of Treasury. It's a completely um, voluntary uh, obligation. And I guess the last sort of thing, and I, I would think this is the most extreme, but you could contact the local law enforcement, uh, your attorney general's office, or even the FBI or the IRS on, at the federal level. Thank you. Uh, of course, there is one uh, mandatory uh, action that real estate professionals should take, uh, must take, when they're uh, presented with $10,000 or more in cash or combinations of cash instruments that total more than $10,000, and that's to file a Form 8300 with the uh, Treasury Department or law enforcement. And uh, our paper goes into detail on that. So uh, is there a sense of whether uh, commercial real estate transactions versus residential are more susceptible to money laundering yeah. schemes? No, that, great, great question. Um, it's a different risk. It, it's a different sort of risk, risk uh, profile. Uh, you know, I think in, in the residential uh, context, what, what, what I've seen a lot in looking at the issue is sort of the crime, the predicate crime 
is often drug trafficking. So it, it's a different, it's a sort of a different type of, uh, of, of predicate crime. In the commercial, in the commercial uh, sphere, we, we, we do see drug trafficking, sort of the proceeds of drug trafficking, but we also see more fraud more sort of white collar fraud, uh, Ponzi schemes that are generating it. So I, I think the sort of the, the, the risk, the, the underlying crime is a little bit different and some of the risk factors are different because in the commercial setting often it, it's, it's a little more complex. They're often using offshore entities, they're wiring money. So it, it, it's, it, I think the, the, what it looks like to the real estate agent is a little bit different and the guidance that we worked with you on is geared towards the residential, um, the residential area. I want to uh, stress how uh, uh, productive and cooperative uh, our U.S. Department of Treasury has been in working with Government Affairs and NAR's legal division, and uh, continuing the dialogue and continuing the effort to equip you with the information and the tools that you need to to help combat uh, money laundering.